this opportunity and then um, I, we will start the presentation. Hope I think I'll just try to share my screen. Is it visible? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. So good morning once again. And um, so being from industry, we are planning to just uh, cover two important use cases in automotive industry today. So it would be mainly just uh, driven by Sayanthan, uh, my colleague, and um, a very bright uh, young person. And uh, let me just proceed actually. Uh, so before actually just uh, venturing into the details of these use cases, uh, let me just spell out what are those two use cases. One is related to what is called as sensor placement optimization. That means we have to just see how to place the sensors on an autom automobile basically to just uh, uh, satisfy certain uh, requirements. That is the first uh, thing. The second one is actually related to image segmentation. So immediately those have already just gone through uh, various sort of lectures and uh, kind of uh, sessions from last, uh, I think many days, uh, can immediately just link into a quantum enhanced optimization and a quantum enhanced machine learning. So before just getting into the details of the use cases, perhaps I just uh, feel uh, it's appropriate to just uh, sprinkle certain uh, sort of uh, points related to this quantum enhanced optimization and uh, machine learning. And also just uh, if, if time permits, I'll just uh, even introduce quantum amplitude estimation very quickly. So my time uh, sort of a slot I'm just planning is for about 15 minutes, uh, but I think there is always a flexibility which we can just exercise. So uh, therefore, again, uh, just a kind, kind of a disclaimer, I think uh, we have carried out um, uh, various uh, tutorial sessions and even the faculty development uh, program sessions. But for the, today, actually we will be just only just giving some pointers because there is no time to just go into a kind of a classroom kind of a mode uh, to even bring out various notions and also basically the concepts. So let me just again, uh, 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 this was also just uh, even uh, mentioned in the last year's uh, event. So we just have we just uh, accommodate many interns. Uh, for example, in this summer, I myself is just uh, guiding around 10 interns actually. Um, so uh, accommodate them and also just uh, make them to grow. And also together with them, just, uh, we are also just actually just producing some useful outputs. And uh, so two, I have to just acknowledge two professors basically. So one is uh, Professor Roman Oras and uh, Stephen uh, Herbert, because some, some portion I'm just going to cover uh, would be mainly of conceptual nature. Therefore, I just uh, felt uh, a little bit uh, leisurely or the kind of a, to taken the liberty to just uh, paste some of their figures and also some of the slide materials. So that should be okay, I guess. So uh, anyway, I've just uh, uh, requested the slides from them and utilizing them for this educational purpose. So, so what is our research? Of, of course, um, uh, our uh, research theme actually looks like enhanced or even quantum algorithm for NISC and beyond. I'm not going to tell what is NISC and uh, beyond means basically we are also referring to uh, basically the futuristic fault tolerant quantum computing. And of course, which uses error correction, which was discussed actually just uh, before this uh, uh, session. So why this uh, importance for the quantum algorithms? Of course, uh, the very uh, uh, two things which actually we keep seeing in um, many quarters in quantum computing or the quantum technologies literature is new algorithms make the biggest computational leaps and the competitive advantage come from in-house algorithms and IPs. So, and also the one more thing, which and again, I think must have been just clear to you. Uh, when we just use quantum computing, I think we have to just choose the right problems to just leverage the capabilities. We can't just simply just put for every task, even though uh, quantum computing can, can solve any classical problem, but we have to just choose the problems which are actually just really going to get benefited by the quantum computers. So optimization, machine learning, sampling and stochastic modeling are some of the three pillars actually which, which which are actually just definitely just identified by the bright minds and also we are also looking into these areas and also consider different uh, sort of applications of them and also there is a research activity uh, happening in quantum chemistry as well at tcs research but present uh, of course for today we are not going to just uh, cover any of those uh, things actually because uh, we don't have even uh, any kind of uh, not even the exposure of course the limited exposure is there but uh, 
not even a kind of capability to just spell out the things which are happening in the quantum chemistry uh, front. So, um, and also uh, we are considering both the gate model based quantum computing and D-Wave annealer. Of course, uh, why, 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 if you just uh, go through various uh, sort of documentations which, is, which are existing, being in industry, we also just look for what are called as TRL levels. That means technology readiness levels. And if you just, I think there are some kind of slightly different numbers, but D-Wave annealers definitely are at a higher technology readiness level. Therefore, we can just put them into some action, um, at least to just demonstrate uh, various potential of quantum computing. And again, I need not actually stress, uh, this D-Wave annealer is a specialized quantum computer, which is actually mainly suitable for optimization tasks. And also we are interested in quantum inspired algorithms because uh, what happens is while just attacking a problem, uh, in a quantum way, at least a module in the whole pipeline in a quantum way, we may just arrive at new classical version and uh, that would not have even just emerged actually just uh, if we had just right away just uh, looked into the existing literature in the classical algorithm front and tried to extend. So that is also one more thing actually which is very important. And of course our first paper actually that we are not going to cover today, if you just, uh, just see, then there is a uh, graph related problem where it was actually the, it's a classical uh, technique, but completely inspired by our degeneracy basically in the quantum mechanics. So I'm not going to just cover that, but I think students can note down because I'm just going to sprinkle a few points so that I think uh, they can be just worth uh, considering after uh, your, uh, whatever this uh, school or the, uh, the lecture series basically to just uh, move forward and also contribute something actually. And um, of course, being in industry, we just started from initial explorations to use cases consolidation. And now I think we have various proof of concept actually at our uh, uh, disposal. And, um, and one more thing is we have very uh, highly diverse business units and research groups. Uh, therefore, our use cases just span across verticals we usually call in industry like banking and finance, life sciences, material design, travel and hospitality related problems, retail, telecom, manufacturing, energy, and so on. So, and one more thing actually, which is very important is um, we have a strong presence in uh, cutting edge end to end classical solutions. Uh, so, and also extensive data, exclusive and extensive data sets are available because uh, many a times when you just attack the quantum machine learning problem, if you just work with some kind of an exclusive data set that itself actually just uh, would be a kind of a differentiator and a kind of value kind of what we call as value propositions, which can emerge actually out of these exclusive data sets. So this is one thing which we have at TCS and we are aggressively trying to just um, some leverage all these strengths uh, to just even uh, work out kind of a, an activity or even the kind of research and development in quantum technologies. So let me just go to the next slide. So just, um, I'm not going into the, any basics of uh, quantum computing, qubits and all those things. Just since I told, uh, mentioned about actually the optimization, I'm just uh, touching upon adiabatic quantum computing. I'm sure actually um, people must have already just uh, even uh, gone through some of the basics. Even may not be in this uh, sort of a school, but uh, uh, maybe actually uh, from different exposures. I know youngsters are like extensively participating in various uh, sort of uh, talks and sessions which are happening across the globe. And that's a good thing actually. So the, they might have already just, uh, uh, just worked out or even just uh, actually just uh, maybe aware of all these things. So, uh, so adiabatic quantum computing, I'm not going to just even elaborate. And quantum money is basically a non-ideal implementation of adiabatic quantum computation. So let me just actually just go to this right-hand side. So in optimization problem, of course, when you just say optimization problem, we have to just formulate what is called as a cost function, basically. And uh, the, so uh, this quantum uh, 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 machine learning, I need not actually just um, mention the importance of it, how actually people are aggressively pursuing it and all those things. So these are some of the sort of uh, points which we have to just actually just uh, uh, consider when we just talk about machine intelligence itself or the machine learning. So we have data distributions, algorithms, plus hard based plus models. And of course, um, uh, it is useful to note that the generalization is the goal of ML. Op there are some various optimization uh, things which you have to just carry out while carrying out machine learning. But the ultimate important goal is basically the generalization. So there are some kind of points also we have just uh, captured uh, for the deep learning uh, progress. Uh, I, think, I think already people must have seen this what is called as double descent curve. So just uh, note down and just check what it is actually.
So this is, uh, it's already some two years old, but uh, worth actually just looking into it. So, and one more thing, I, again, uh, I will just reiterate this point. Uh, when we just want to handle basically the, the solutions for the real life problems, let us say even in the industry grade problem, we have what is called as this kind of directed acyclic graph thing, basically. So, uh, so we have the classical nodes, quantum nodes connected in, in this directed acyclic fraction. And we have to just um, uh, make sure that we just orchestrate actually the entire structure to get the requisite solution. So this classical quantum hybrid, again, actually just entering in the, um, uh, not only in the NISCARA, but it's going to be the, just the, the NAR uh, in future as, as well. So next, uh, then there are these four things actually already many people must have just memorized basically. We have different versions of uh, what is called as QML basically, but presently the popular one is we have the classical data and the quantum uh, algorithms. Of course, again, we have to remember when you say quantum algorithm, there is also a classical computing portion associated with that actually. And one more thing I want to just mention that, uh, of course, there are various reasons why QM, QML is just uh, has emerged as a very good uh, candidate in the NISC era. So I'm just uh, leaving it aside. You can read that actually if, if possible while I'm talking something else. So, so the, um, uh, presently, I think most of the, QML uh, algorithms, actually they, we just uh, uh, somehow work with uh, basically the gate model based quantum computing. Of course, there are some efforts uh, even to just um, carry out certain tasks related to um, quantum machine learning using our D-Wave and ALS. So th that's what actually I just, uh, uh, just captured here because there's a latest paper in uh, 2021, Cubo formulations for training machine learning models. So therefore D-Wave and ALS are also just getting exploited, but the prevalent uh, uh, thing which we have to just consider when we just uh, work with quantum machine learning is basically the gate model based quantum computing. So then actually I will just uh, leave this because it would be covered. The Basically we have, the, we have to just, whenever we have the classical data, that's what I just said, it's more prevalent now. You have to encode into the appropriate quantum states and sometimes called as feature maps. So all those things would be just covered uh, uh, in a short span uh, from now on uh, by Sainton. So just, I'm not going to just go through it. I think these are all um, a kind of standard now. And also uh, sometimes we just keep seeing why we have to repeat the layers. So this actually, again, I will leave it as an exercise to the students because um, of course I will share these slides basically. So you will come to know that finally, if you just take what is called as where this quantum circuit model, basically that the variational quantum circuit model, basically uh, the, for the, the quantum machine learning, uh, the, then it actually just approximates Fourier series basically. Of course the partial Fourier series. So in order to just get reasonable approximation, we have to repeat basically. So that's kind of, thing which is getting um, uh, just um, somehow reinforced through these kinds of studies. So why I'm just stressing uh, these things? Because many a times uh, when we just have these kinds of beautiful uh, um, uh, SDKs, uh, the software development kits to just play with, and also some, some many a times we can also just uh, access, uh, nowadays I think only the small qubit hardware, we can just put some thoughts and just uh, run and just uh, see how things are going to just behave. But after that, actually, we have to just make uh, why things are behaving that way or we have to build the theory and all those things. And there is an extensive thing which is also happening apart from just um, uh, build and run approach to come out with rigorous formulations to address various sort of issues which actually are prevalent in uh, machine learning, including the quantum machine learning. So this is what actually just uh, I wanted to just uh, uh, touch upon. And uh, then one more thing, I, I think we'll just stop for uh, this uh, last uh, Point. Um, for example, this is what I was telling. Multiple classical quantum algorithm components are usually involved in the end-to-end -end solution for real-life use case, with the potential for any such component to become bottleneck and negate the overall quantum advantage. The task of computing the quantum speed of the solution of a specific use case is therefore not always intuitive. This is extremely important. So what I'm trying to say is when we talk of uh, quantum computing, there are two things which you have to just keep in mind. One is basically just how do we just, uh, that's what is called as data IO problem. How do you get the data into the system? And also just how do we take it out? So sometimes even by taking a, which, uh, the problem of just uh, getting the data into the system itself uh, may just actually just uh, negate all the sort of advantages. And also now we are talking about a very complicated pipeline of various quantum and classical modules. 
and then any one mod one or one module actually in the pipeline may just become a bottleneck and negate actually some of the advantages we are going to just uh, glean uh, by in, uh, just making some of them quantum actually so what I mean, the whole uh, thing is actually we when of course whenever we just uh, try to look into this we want to just get some advantages let us say either the speed up are using the lesser number of training samples that may also sometimes just actually just uh, lead into speed up but also sometimes when you have data right in the from the beginning very limited itself that is an advantage and how actually the generalization which is going to just um, uh, emerge what is the kind of explainability we can we get actually out of quantum because it can not be too deep compared to the classical uh, machine learning uh, paradigms so all those things actually there are some kind of benefits we may just uh, uh, just actually just uh, think of while uh, handling the quantum machine learning but uh, when you have this kind of pipeline the caution is basically to fire, put the uh, complete uh, kind of an end to end benefit uh, into a kind of perspective may not be always right forward so therefore um, uh, when we just see okay somebody is telling uh, there is a spectacular advantage we have to just see from this overall perspective this is extremely important when we just uh, solve some kind of industry grade problems so with that i will just stop because there were so many things to just uh, cover but um, uh, just as a kind of sprinkler and also uh, for the students to just uh, even move forward uh, these points can be just noted down and in the interest of time we will take the questions towards the end because some of the things will be more clearer uh, once we just talk of the uh, use cases. So over to you, Sainthan, and uh, then uh, without further uh, delay, we will start because I've already just uh, taken up more than 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks, Giris. And, uh, you know, we can always give a little bit more time. It's not a problem. Voice, voice. Thanks for that, actually. Yeah. So, Sainthan, over to you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prashant, sir. This is also our first, uh, second time interacting. So, yeah. Um, Can I just, before we start, you know, I see your experience very nice one. Nuclear and the particle physics, you have done something, right? That was just a course. Uh, I was interested in physics uh, ah. during my bachelor's. Ah. Uh, so I just did an MPTL course on nuclear physics. Okay. Okay. So very nice. You have a lot of interesting things we'll interact with later on. Maybe do some collaboration. Some of the students if they're interested. So please go ahead. Yeah. Definitely, sir. Uh, we will be happy to. Sure. And uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Yeah, In the yeah, meantime, uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, yeah, you are not. You are not. Oh, right. And uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yeah. Yeah. Visible. Yeah. You can make it full screen. Yes, I will. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's not afternoon yet. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us here. And uh, as Dr. Girish mentioned towards the beginning of the call, since this is an industry session, we instead of getting into the details and technicalities of various optimization and machine learning models, which I'm sure must have been covered in the previous sessions, we will look into use cases and problems that we have been solving and some idea about how those problems can be approached. So specifically, we, we are going to take uh, two use cases in the automotive industry and these two use cases, as again, Dr. Girish had mentioned, are on the optimization of sensor placement on the surface of automobiles. And the second one is on detecting anomalies from images using quantum enhanced image processing. So both of these uh, use cases, both of these problems are actually from last year's BMW quantum computing challenge. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the challenge, but uh, for those of us who are not, it was launched last year by BMW and it had four different problem statements. Uh, one of the problems was on material simulation. There were two problems on op optimization. One of the problems was on, uh, one of those optimization problems was on optimizing the number of test vehicles that are required and also the configuration of those test vehicles at various automotive uh, organizations. And also the series or sequence in which the tests can be planned so that the number of test vehicles can be minimized because developing prototypes for the, those testings and at the end of the test, those prototypes are almost always invariably destroyed. They are not uh, usable anymore. So that has some cost. So, and the organization would like to minimize that cost for increasing their profit margins. So that was the requirement there. The second optimization problem was the one that we'll be talking about in shortly was on sensor placement optimization. 
And the fourth use case is also something that we'll be discussing today. That was on detecting anomalies from images using quantum computing. We will look at that also. So at any time during the presentation, please do feel free to stop me and ask questions. Um, I'll try my best to answer them. And for this BMW quantum computing challenge, uh, we had par formally participated from TCS in the image processing use case. And I'm happy to share that we were in the top three finalists in the world. We did not end up winning, but yeah, that, that was fine. And after the challenge had concluded, we also thought of trying our hand at uh, solving one of the optimization use cases just to see uh, what kind of solutions we could uh, arrive at and if we could also try to create some new ways to approach optimization problems using quantum computing. Any questions so far? All right. So first we will talk about the sensor placement optimization problem. And whatever we'll be discussing on this problem today, it's already under review at uh, the IEEE Quantum Week, which is going to be held in September this year. Um, the results are not out, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll not be getting into the entire technical details of the solution, but we'll have a very uh, high overview of the solution that we considered. So the problem statement is as such. Um, so we know that the vehicles that we ride today, they have a lot of sensors that are placed on those vehicles. Now the sensors are placed because those sensors, they act as the sense organs for those vehicles and they provide a way of gathering information from the vehicle surroundings. Now, if we talk about automated uh, driving, then in that case, the vehicles need to take a decision on their own. The, that, that is why it's called automated and not manual. And to be able to take decisions, the automobile needs to know what's going on in its surroundings. Otherwise, it won't be able to take a decision. Or even if it takes a random decision, it's, go, it's very likely that it's going to be a wrong one. So the sensors, they allow the vehicle to know about the surroundings and appropriately process that information to take a decision. So, and even in the non-autonomous uh, non, um, cases, the, the information that is obtained from the sensors, they can be used to assist the drivers or the users to make some kind of a decision. For example, we have this assisted parking where uh, there are cameras placed at the posterior of the vehicle. And unlike previously, the, the drivers, they don't need to look uh, outside from their windows and uh, see towards the uh, rear side just to see if they are going to crash into any vehicle or any obstacle at the back or a person does not even have to provide directions that this is how a vehicle can be parked that um, they can go further be, uh, behind or something nowadays there's a camera at the dashboard and the camera relays the feed from the camera which is at the back, uh, sorry, there's a screen on the dashboard and that screen relays the feed from the camera which is at the back of the vehicle and the driver can just park the vehicle without the assistance of anyone outside. So these are the typical use cases and uh, that show why sensors are required on the vehicles. So this, now if you look at this chart, uh, this uh, figure, then this small blue color rectangle that we see on the uh, towards the middle of the uh, figure, this is actually the vehicle. It appears very tiny because it has been scaled down. And uh, the red colored region that we see around the vehicle is called the region of interest. Now, the region of interest is the area or the volume around the vehicle that needs to be covered by the sensors. So these are the areas that are from which inform important information can be pulled. And uh, this region of interest, if we look at, it, it's not uniformly colored, right? Some of the areas are lighter in color and some of the other areas are darker in color. That's because um, not all the points in this region of interest are equally important. The points which are uh, shown in using a light shade, those have a uh, very low importance and the points which are shown with a darker shade, they have a relatively higher importance. And this criticality, it's quantified by a scalar number, which goes from zero to one. Zero means uh, the point is not important at all. 
and one means the point is extremely important it's imperative to have it covered by at least one of the sensors that we place on the vehicle and just to give a perspective about the problem size we are talking about i'm sure most of us might have guessed it already since the size of this blue square blue rectangle is already so tiny this region of interest it has about 100000 points and those 100000 points are spaced at a distance of about 0.5 meter uh, apart from each other and this red colored region of interest it covers about the volume of 40000 cubic meters around the vehicle so it's not a trivial or small problem by any uh, measure but this is a problem which is not so large that classical optimization techniques today cannot handle so the purpose of giving this kind of a challenge was to see if quantum computing quantum optimization techniques can also perform uh, perform at least as well as the classical techniques and still uh, when we move to regimes where the data size is larger hopefully there we will be able to see some kind of a benefit so we talked about the region of interest now there are a couple of points that we need to discuss about the sensors as well so in the challenge it was mentioned that we could uh, consider only four different types of sensors and these types of sensors are as we have mentioned here they are camera lidar radar and ultrasonic and uh, basically what we have to do is we have to select which of, which of these sensors we are going to use and then we also have to select where we are going to place that sensor on the surface of the vehicle and the third variable is to select at which angle of orientation with respect to the vehicle we are going to place that sensor so these are the decision variables in our optimization problem and basically it boils down to selecting a portfolio of sensors out of all the given possible configurations which can kind of uh, ensure that the entire region of interest or at least the maximum amount of the region of interest is covered by the sensors so um when we are talking about a sensor we also need to talk about its field of view right so if we think of a flashlight a torch when we turn that flashlight on we know that the light that the flashlight throws that is kind of a cone now similarly a sensor the area or the volume that a sensor can cover that can also be given by a similar elliptical cone it's not going to be a circular cone because the cross section is not guaranteed to be circular it's going to be elliptical because sensors work with two different kinds of parameters one is the horizontal sweep that is the horizontal angle that the sensors can cover and the other is the vertical sweep which is again the vertical angle that the sensor can cover and when these two angles are not exactly equal to each other the cross section of the field of view of the sensor it's not going to be circular it's going to be elliptical and apart from these vertical and horizontal fields of uh, these angles we also have something called the range of the sensor now range of the sensor is nothing but how far from its uh, point of placement that sensor can see or look into so it it's basically it basically refers to the length of the um axis of the elliptical cone and uh, apart from these three parameters there is another parameter which is not really a physical or uh, or a parameter that characterizes the field of view of the sensor but rather it's a cost of the sensor so we talked about four different kinds of sensors and not all of them are priced equally for example uh, ultrasonic sensor since it does not depend on electromagnetism and it has a very short range um the horizontal and uh, vertical sweeps are also not very high that's why it does not uh, cost very much it's it's a very cheap sensor but comparatively if we look at camera or lidar they, they are more expensive so when we are selecting which sensors we need to place on the vehicle we also need to be mindful about the cost of the sensors we are selecting so that is all about the sensor uh, parameters now when we are placing the sensors on the surface of the vehicle we need to know what kind of coverage we are getting by that particular placement of the sensors and this coverage is going to be the cost function or the objective function that we typically uh, maximize or minimize in an optimization problem so in this case if we suppose uh, consider this blue color rectangle again as the as the vehicle 
and this red colored region around the vehicle again is the region of interest. This is an oversimplification where we consider that um, it's uniform around the vehicle. We are not, uh, just for the purpose of visualization, we are not considering the entire complexity of the problem. But suppose we place a sensor at this particular position and that has a field of view which is given by this green colored sector. So if we take only a, a 2D projection of an elliptical cone, it's going to be kind of a sector. This ideally should have been a straight line, but just for representation purposes, we can consider it to be a, a sectoral area. And the second sensor, if we place it here, then that has a field of view which is given by this yellow colored uh, sector. Now, if we look at uh, these two fields of views, we see that this part of the yellow colored field of view is not overlapping with the region of interest. So it's covering an area which is not interesting to the vehicle or, or it's covering a part of the space around the vehicle which does not uh, fall within the region of interest. So this kind of coverage is wasted. It, the, it does not give us any kind of extra benefit. Similarly, for this green color field of view also, this part is not relevant to us. So we'll, we'll strip them off. This is not required. So finally, uh, what we are left with is uh, these two triangles that, that overlap with the region of interest and give us some kind of an advantage. But even between these two fields of views, we see that this particular triangle that we see, that is the overlap between the fields of view themselves. What happens here is this particular region of this particular part of the region of interest is covered twice. And that also does not give us any kind of extra benefit. So we need to discount for this kind of a factor also. So given these two sensors, which are placed at these two positions, the final field of view that we would have would kind of look like this. And to quantify what kind of coverage we are getting out of this uh, field of view, if all of the points in this region of interest uh, had the same criticality index, if all of the points were uh, as important as any other point in the region of interest, then we could have just taken a ratio of the areas. That is a ratio of the field of interest, the field of view that is given by the sensors to that of the total region of interest. We could have used that as some kind of a metric which needed to be maximized. But uh, since that is not the simple case that we're dealing with, uh, the, the, uh, the points in the region of interest, they have separate criticality indices. So basically what we will do is we will not take a direct uh, summation uh, to get the area, but we will use a weighted summation kind of thing. And when we take the weighted summation, then uh, the coverage that we get from a particular configuration of sensors takes this kind of a, um, equation form where C I J K C subscript I J K is the criticality index of the point I J K in the region of interest and R subscript I J K, it denotes whether that point is covered by a sensor or not covered. So it's basically a binary variable. And this is in the numerator. In the denominator, we basically divide by the sum of the criticality indices of all the points. Here, the, doc the challenge document itself had R subscript IJK, but this is a typo, it should have been C sub subscript IJK. And this quantity that we call the coverage, that is the V cover, this needs to be maximized as we discussed uh, by the configuration of sensors that we choose. Any questions so far, please? Right. So the objective function for this uh, sensor placement problem, it cannot be as simple as just maximizing the coverage because the coverage can be maximized if we fill the surface of the vehicle with sensors, with as many sensors as we can place on that. But that is going to be a very trivial and a bad solution because we need to remember that the sensors also are expensive. They come at a cost. And if we place too many sensors on the surface of the vehicle, then that is going to be going to drive the cost of the vehicle up. And that is not a very ideal scenario. So we need to account for the cost of the sensors as well. So if we denote the cost of the sensors that we select by this uh, parameter, by, by this variable C, then what we do is we take a linear combination of the coverage as well as the cost. So we multiply the coverage with a term minus A, where A is a positive constant, 
and we multiply the cost term with a positive constant which is given by b and uh, the entire summation that we have here we try to minimize this uh, this particular uh, uh, function uh, we are trying to minimize this one because we are multiplying the coverage part with minus so if we were trying to maximize coverage we will try to minimize the negative of coverage and similarly the cost part is also something we are trying to minimize so this will serve as the overall objective function for our optimization problem and the choices of the constants a and b that we have selected a we have taken as one because we think that the coverage is of utmost importance uh, we we should not be uh, uh, we should not be kind of uh, um undermining the coverage that a, sen a sensor configuration can provide because the cost is of lesser concern compared to the coverage so for the b parameter the this constant we consider a rel relatively low value of 0.0001 which is 10 to the uh, raise minus 4 um so this is not too small a value if we consider that this uh, variable c it takes values typically in the range of thousands of dollars so if we consider all the sensors that are getting placed on the surface of a vehicle they will typically uh, amount to around 4000 or 5000 dollars so we when we divide 4000 by 10000 then we are going to get a number which is also going to be roughly in the range of 0 to 1 so we see that both the terms in this objective function they have a similar kind of range and this is important because otherwise one of the terms in the objective function would have over overpowered the other term and that is not a very good scenario to be in so now that the objective function for us is defined there are a couple of more assumptions or considerations that we need to make so if we go back to the representation of the region of interest around the vehicle we see that uh, this particular side this left side is the back of the vehicle the right side is the front and similarly the top and bottom are the left and right sides so we see that the region of interest for the back side the posterior side has a very low overlap with the region of interest for the left side for example and the region of interest for the posterior has no overlap at all with the region of interest for the front so basically what this means is we don't need to tackle the entire problem at the same time because that would have increase the data size for us that would have increased the number of decision variables and that directly translates to using a higher number of qubits and we know that in this noisy intermediate scale quantum era we don't really have too many qubits at our disposal so what we do is we decompose this problem into four different sides that is we solve the problem first for the front then for the back and for the left and right sides all independently and once we have solution for all the four sides um we we combine the solutions we collate the solutions to get the final solution yes this is going to be a little sub optimal it's not going to be the exact op optimal solution that we could have obtained because between the front and the left sides there is a slight overlap but if we had not considered this kind of a decomposition then for the entire problem at the considered at the same time we could not even have solved it using any kind of quantum techniques or so we could not even have solved it on the state of the art quantum annealers even so the decomposition at least allows us to solve the problem to an extent presently the other kind of uh, consideration that we had to make while solving the problem is um the sides of the vehicle they are not really just uh, plain surfaces they have some kind of curves also and those curves have have, have to be completely ignored and even then we cannot really represent a particular side of a vehicle by a single 2d surface because if we look at the front of this vehicle then we have this this part which is the windshield then we have the bonnet and then we have the front of the vehicle right the, uh, i don't know exactly what it's called but the cow catcher part kind of thing but if we consider all of these complexities it's going to make a model extremely difficult to solve it's going to add a lot of constraints and If, if we know that if we add constraints to a quantum optimization problem we need to include more and more lagrange multipliers and that's going to create uh, more difficulty or more problems for us so what we consider is a given side of a vehicle 
can be represented by only a single 2D plane. And even in that single 2D plane, we can't place the sensors at all the points on that plane because continuous optimization is difficult for quantum to handle. And continuous optimization is also kind of a easy problem because we can use uh, different techniques like simplex method or even gradient information to solve them. To make this problem a little more difficult uh, to make it NP hard, what we say is we discretize each side of the vehicle into say a four by four grid. Now this shows a four by two grid. So what happens is the intersection points of these grids, only those positions we can place our sensors on. So on a four by four grid, we'll have 16 possible positions where sensors can be placed. And similarly, this kind of discretization is done or quantization, quantization is done for all the sides of the vehicle, all four sides. And uh, the third kind of consideration that the challenge document themselves had suggested is, if it was found that the model was getting too complicated, too large, then the angle at which we can place a sensor on a given site, that can also be fixed to just the perpendicular direction. That is, if we are going to place a sensor on a surface, the sensor is always going to point perpendicular to the surface outwards from the vehicle. But uh, we found that the kind of models we were considering, um, it was not getting too large. So we considered this per perpendicular case also and the free orientation case also, where we considered only four different orientations for the sensors which, at which the sensors can be placed. So we'll be going through the results uh, for those models subsequently. But uh, before that, we solved this problem using two different techniques, two different models. Both of these models have some advantages and some disadvantages. So the first model that we considered, there the disadvantage is the number of sensors that we can typically place on a given side of a vehicle that was fixed. So we can always place an upper bound that on the front of the vehicle, we are not going to place more than eight sensors or not going to place more than 12 sensors because placing any more sensors is not going to be feasible because the cost will increase and the re return on investment we will be getting is kind of, uh, it will start saturating with more and more sensors we place. So we fix the sensor count at a given, uh, at, at a given number and then we solve the problem. But this also had the advantage that if we have n different, if that is small n different uh, options at which the sensors can be placed or the angles at which the sensors can be placed, then the number of qubits that we would require to solve this problem using this model would be log of n, where the base of this logarithm is true. So the qubit count that we would require here is very, very low and efficient. So this is the, um, these are the advantages and disadvantages of the first model. In the second model, what we did is, uh, we considered something called the weighted set coverage problem. This is typically used in mathematical optimization. It's a form of an optimization problem. And in this problem, we introduced some kind of assumptions, some kind of considerations to convert this problem into quadratic. And not just quadratic, it was, a, it was converted to a convex quadratic problem. And convex quadratic problems, they have a very good property that the local minima that we get from a convex quadratic problem is also going to be the global minima. So, so this uh, point uh, about local minima and global minima, I'm sure must have been covered in uh, previous optimization sessions using quantum methods. So if this model, it guarantees that if we find any, any minimum in the optimization landscape, then it's guaranteed to be a global one. So that is extremely advantageous for us. But on the flip side, um, the other advantage from this model is that uh, the number of sensors in this model, it does not have to be fixed. That is the appropriate number of sensors that can be placed on that particular side of the vehicle will also be an output from the optimization model itself. But the disadvantage from this model is if we have small and different number of uh, possible configurations, then we would need small n number of qubits. So unlike a logarithmic number of qubits that we would have needed for the first model, for the second model, we need a linear number of qubits, which is higher than logarithmic, but um, it also gives us some extra information about the number of sensors that can be placed. So 
if we want some extra information from the model, we have to compensate for it in some form or the other. And that compensation in this problem comes in the form of a higher qubit requirement, higher qubit count. And both the problems along with uh, uh, VQE, we used a variational quantum eigensolver to solve both of these uh, um, models. The, sec the first model was not really ideal for an annealing kind of use case. We will not get into the technical details about why annealing was not um, very suitable for this formulation. But this model was, this first model was solved using only VQE. And on the classical side, we used a state of the art solver called CPLEX, which is from IBM, to solve the same problem. And what that basically did is it provided us some kind of a benchmark to compare the results from the quantum model against. And for the second model, this was suitable for both the gate-based approach as well as annealing. So we solved it using VQE as well as DVF simulated annealer. And we compared the results that we got from this approach with the results we got from the uh, IBM CPLEX optimizer. So going through the results of uh, both the models, um, here what we have is the case where multiple orientation for the sensors is allowed. That is, we it need not be the case that the sensors need to be placed only perpendicular to the surface of the vehicle. They can be placed at uh, other angles of orientation also. So in this case, what happened is uh, we see that model one, this is the first model that we just talked about in the previous uh, slide. The quantum solution and the classical solution that we obtained, the classical solution we would do well to remember that CPLEX is going to give us the optimal solution for this kind of uh, problem size. So this is the best, absolute best solution that the that, that this optimization model can have. This is the absolute optimal one. And the quantum solution that we get, it's going to be optimal or suboptimal. We cannot guarantee because VQE or annealing kind of uh, uh, techniques, they are uh, meta heuristic techniques. They are not exact optimization techniques. But still, we see that using a quantum model, we get a, around 91.6% of coverage. And the cost of the sensors that we uh, see for that model is around $2,100. $2, but the classical solution that we get, which is the optimal solution from CPLEX, that has a coverage of about 92.6%, about 1% higher than, classic, uh, than quantum. And the cost of the solution is also lower at $1,700. So we see that uh, quantum is close to the optimal solution, the classical solution, but not exactly at the same uh, position. It's, but this is still a very encouraging result for us because the quantum solution is still within 1% of the classical solution, the optimal solution. And if meta techniques can provide solutions which are as good almost as good as the optimal one. Then as we increase the problem size at those large scale problems, we won't be able to use the exact solution techniques. The, the classical methods, uh, the classical exact methods in those cases will start failing, but those problem sizes will still be tractable for meta heuristic based techniques or even the quantum meta heuristic techniques like QAOA, VQE or even annealing. And if we have a look at the graphs that are there on the right side of the screen, the charts, there uh, the orange colored curves, they are the classical uh, solutions that we obtain for, on the x-axis we have the number of sensors that we can, that we selected, that can be placed on that particular side of the vehicle. And on the y-axis on the, on this chart, we have the coverage and on the lower chart, we have the cost. So the, the classical optimization uh, schedule, it had to be run only once because as we know, the classical solution is going to be deterministic. So no matter how many times we run this solution, we run this model, we are always going to get the same solution. But on the other hand, we know that quantum optimization techniques, QAOA, VQE, uh, annealing, etc., they are all, they are all inherently probabilistic. So every time that we run the quantum optimization models, they are going to return a different answer. So what we had to do there is we had to run the model 10 times. Um, 10 is just a number we selected. So we run n different experiments and 
the average of the results from those experiments we have represented using these dots and what these vertical bars represent are the minimum and maximum kind of coverage or cost that we saw for all of those n runs and uh, we can notice here that the best kind of coverage that we obtain from the quantum solution almost always coincides with the classical best coverage so that is also another encouraging fact for us and uh, this was repeated for all the sides of the vehicle um, this is for the right side this is for the left and similarly we have for the front and back also and these are the plots we obtained from the first model things change a bit when we go to the second model that we discussed in the previous slide what happens here is since we were able to express the problem as a convex quadratic problem here we see that uh, the best solution that we can obtain is 91.36 percent in coverage and 1500 dollars in the cost from the classical model and on the quantum side we have a coverage of about 91.1 percent and a cost of about 1520 dollars so the difference between the optimal solution and the quantum solution is much lower in this case because we were able to formulate the problem in a way which is quite suitable for quantum because we need to express quantum optimization problems as cubo that is quadratic unconstrained binary optimization and convex quadratic problems as the name suggests they are also quadratic so there was a very good match between the formulation which quantum expects and the formulation that we had created so the solution that we obtain is also of a better quality and uh, we had repeated the same kind of uh, um optimization model solving for the case where the sensors can be placed only perpendicular to the surface so there also we obtained the results where the quantum solutions are all, always within 1% of the optimal solution um again just to reiterate the point just for the uh, sake of redundancy if we obtain solutions which are very close to the optimal solution using quantum meta heuristic techniques then that is a very good thing for us because at higher problem sizes at larger problem sizes where exact solution techniques cannot work there hopefully we'll get some kind of a quantum benefit out of uh, using the quantum methods instead of the classical ones any questions uh, before we move on to the next use case on image processing ah uh, sayanthan actually there are two question one one question just i answered actually uh, related to quantum modeling and adiabatic quantum computing and and, and uh, the person also seems to be happy as far as the answer is concerned there is one query related to how did we arrive at actually the lagrange multipliers uh, like a equals one and other things any optimization done on that and uh, another uh, important question actually just uh, just now popped up is uh, let me read the optimization problem seems to be classical what is the reason that uh, uh, quantum optimization techniques were introduced and compared uh, with the classical uh, model would you elaborate where the quantum physics entered enter in the problem i think we will collectively handle that i think just if you uh, take the first question on um, lagrange parameters that's then we will move to the second question right right so in this case we don't really have any lagrange parameters because this model does not have any uh, any kind of constraints as such it does have a few constraints but we found that those constraints were not binding constraints so those if the if a given constraint is not binding then that constraint can be ignored altogether the parameters a and b that we have here they are weights they are not lagrange parameters only when we include constraints into the objective function then those uh, scalar values are called lagrange parameters and optimization of those lagrange parameters is necessary it's always required but since these are weights in the objective functions themselves itself the this a and b these come from domain expertise the, the so there has to be a person who has a lot of knowledge in this given domain and that person has to tell us what is the relative weight that we should uh, provide for the coverage and what is the relative weight we should provide for the cost part so we are not going to optimize over these uh, uh, given weights or we are not even going to iterate over these with um, multiple values because they are uh, they are given to us by an sme a uh, subject matter expert does that answer the first question yes it looks like yeah 
let us go to the second question i think uh, so yeah, i think uh, even uh, he said thanks uh, so let us go to the second question actually that i think anyway you can recollect so of course the problem itself is definitely as we were mentioning can be solved through classical optimization sain then we can bring couple of points actually of course we have used the vqa and also the quantum right. modeler and uh, just i will put two kind of generic remarks here uh, i just also already mentioned something about this quantum optimization basically or quantum enhanced optimization to be more precise uh, then actually if you just see look from finding the ground state energy which actually just actually pushes out the solution this appears to be a natural a sort of a candidate to solve the problem uh, and apart from that why i introduce adiabatic quantum computing is actually of course um, uh, uh, there is one beautiful kind of a link there we just evolve from time uh, t equals 0 to uh, time t, t equals capital t so therefore uh, it brings the time complexity so if you just go through some of the existing literature and also kind of uh, neat studies uh, in certain cases we can get the quadratic advantage by going through the quantum optimization somehow i think you must have seen this quadratic advantage keeps uh, means uh, uh, appearing again and again in different scenarios like in the grover search and even in the quantum amplitude estimation uh, i just mentioned and even for certain hard optimization problem there is a quadratic advantage possible by going through uh, quantum optimization of course there are also real life scenarios which are which are examined let us say for example by multiverse startup where they could just demonstrate about 400 to 500 times speed up compared to classical optimization apart from that when the classical problem becomes larger and larger uh, then actually there is a kind of a strain on the classical routines and also they may that sainthan usually just calls it as they may struggle actually to just push out the output sainthan you want to add uh, many other things of course when you say vqe and also uh, this quantum annealer automatically there are various other quantum effects which are entering to the scenario that to bring that one right. it's a superposition even quantum tunneling and so on so this is a kind of a rather generic answer but the science right, is elaborate little more right sir so um, the the simplest analog that i could provide the simplest kind of explanation for uh, uh, quantum advantage and optimization is um, suppose we have a ball and we are rolling that ball down a hill we know that the ball is always going to go downhill it's going to follow gravity because a system always tries to minimize its energy and it tries to do so in a, a way which minimizes the action so with that we know that as the least action principle so what we do in optimization problems is we try to map the problem to a physical system and we try to do, do that mapping cleverly in such a way that the minimum energy state of the system will give us the solution to the problem it will give us the optimal solution and when the mapping has been done what we do is we just let the system evolve we let it do its thing the ball will always roll downhill and find the lowest energy energy spot what we then do is we just read the system and we'll get the solution out of it so we let nature take care of the minimization or the maximization for us instead of us having to do it classically using computers because for a classical computer whether we have a number 10 or a number 6 it doesn't really matter to it much but for a physical system 10 joules of energy versus 6 joules of energy system is always going to prefer 6 joules of energy over 10 so that is the easiest way where i could uh, in which i could explain why quantum could provide some benefit in optimization problems here also vqe QAOA, um, this uh, annealing, they use a, they, they use the same principle in, in optimization problems. Basically, it's trying to find the uh, lowest energy uh, eigen function, uh, uh, lowest uh, eigen state for a given system. And the other advantages that we get you out of using quantum, as Girish sir also mentioned, that uh, we have superposition, which does not really have a classical analog. We have entanglement. which again is a quantum specific phenomenon and uh, we cannot simulate entanglement at a very high scale classically and how entanglement helps us in optimization problems is it helps us model correlations between the decision variables in our problem so suppose we have 
two variables x1 and x2 and they are supposed to be negatively correlated with each other if we have to get, model the scenario classically then we would have to introduce another uh, function or another uh, if else kind of statement or something but in case of quantum we know that negative correlations can be very easily handled uh, using entanglement so we can think of the bell state where uh, the system is in the uh, state of equal superposition of 0 1 and 1 0 so if one of the qubits is 0 the other qubit will always give 1 and vice versa so these kinds of uh, quantum effects superposition interference entanglement they also provide some benefits in uh, optimization and this is apart from quantum tunneling which is directly relevant uh, for optimization kind of use cases uh, i hope that answers the question to an extent do you convert these optimization problems into icing model and that the hamiltonian is quadratic that's another question i'm just saying correct correct yes we do yeah. we do and uh, the modeling uh, i wish we could have covered here we could have covered here but since uh, this paper is presently under review we we can't really do that but uh, we express the problem as an icing problem and it helps if we have only uh, quadratic terms so what we did in the second formulation is we had higher order terms also, but we chose to ignore those terms because we were able to um, kind of show that um, the with the assumption, the objective value for our, pro, uh, our model was always going to be a little lower than the actual objective function. And for minimization, if we minimize a value which is lower than the actual value, then that is still going to minimize the actual function itself. So, yeah, that way we are expressing it as an Ising formulation and with it, it was also quadratic. So, then again, just a kind of pointer to the youngsters. So, if you just see, seen the classical or the real mathematical uh, uh, definition of the problem or the statement of the problem, there was no clue how to just go about actually. For example, the weighted set coverage problem, you have to just carefully think and then uh, put your thoughts appropriately. And also many a times we have to just uh, even reduce the size of the problem while reducing. I think we should not actually just ridiculously reduce uh, stating much going into the kind of a situation where it looks utterly kind of tie-ish. So uh, even those small details, how, how actually we can downscale the problem, all those things when we just start solve these kinds of realistic problems will emerge actually. So unfortunately, because of uh, the, we were expecting the review to be out today, but I think I may just come, but anyway, I think in, down the lane, we will be having this actually available publicly. So at that time, I think you will find out how, how actually there are various intricacies which are actually just looked into carefully in solving this real life problem. So my sort of suggestion for the youngsters is uh, take the some kind of slightly bigger problem. We even when you want to downsize it, actually downsize it in a sort of judicious way so that I think the real realistic nature of it is somehow maintained and then push all these kinds of newer ideas, not just for the sake of pushing, but uh, carefully thought out and uh, meticulously just executed. So that's what actually we wanted to co convey. Uh, so for uh, uh, particularly the younger audience, because from India side, we have to just really just have to uh, produce so much actually in this area. And uh, it's one actually of our, our uh, intention is to just trigger some of these kinds of stuff uh, at the, I mean, in, the younger, in the younger minds. So if we give, uh, if we have another 15 minutes, perhaps we can just take up the um, uh, image of segmentation use case also, is it not science? Otherwise, uh, I will request ask the professor host, basically. Uh, yes, request the host to please comment on that. We are already about uh, 20 yeah, minutes yeah. over. Yeah, time. okay, okay, you go ahead, no problem. Go ahead, I'll talk to the to hold on for some time. Please go ahead, no problem. Sure. Thanks uh, a lot. So professor. I'll try to quickly cover, cover this in 10, 15 minutes. Um, so here, what we had to do is we have a, we have images basically, and those images have cracks in them. And using quantum techniques, the requirement was to fi first find which images contain cracks and then segment the cracks also from those images. So segmentation for those who are not familiar with the term is finding the exact location and the shape of the crack. And um, crack segmentation is actually one special case of uh, object segmentation and the data set that we had uh, been that we had been pointed to in the BMW quantum challenge this was just the first phase of it it was the Kaggle surface uh, crack detection data set 
And what this data set had is, it had about 40,000 images and it was a balanced data set. So 20,000 of those images did contain cracks in them and the other 20,000 did not contain cracks. So the crack part, the images which contain cracks, they were labeled as positive and which did not contain cracks were label, labeled as negative. But it was not uh, a simple partition like that because there, there are a little, there are a few more subtleties which are involved. For example, in the positive labeled images, it's not necessary that uh, those images will contain only one crack. They can also con contain multiple cracks. As we see in this first image here, this has two cracks. The second problem that we uh, face, uh, that we often faced in this data set is, sometimes the cracks were too thin and it was difficult for even human eyes to detect those cracks. So, and uh, at other times what happened is, the boundary between the cracks and the non-crack region, that was blurred out, that was not clearly defined. So if we look at this part of the image, we know that this part contains a crack, but it's difficult to exactly pinpoint uh, where the crack is, where the crack starts and where the crack ends. So these kinds of uh, difficulties, um, they have to be accounted for. And uh, it does not mean that the negative part of the data set, that is the one which did not have cracks, there we did not have any kind of complica uh, complications. There the complications were like, we had different textures, we had different aberrations, we had uh, different discoloration, etc., which kind of mimic the look of cracks. So, for example, this dent that we have here, it's not a crack, but it looks very similar to a crack, except for its shape, uh, its uh, size, its uh, uh, coloration, everything matches with that of a crack, but still, it, it was not labeled as such. So these kinds of scenarios also had to be handled. And uh, having discussed about the data set, this is not a very difficult problem to solve classically because deep learning has advanced uh, to a large extent over the last uh, one or two decades. And uh, what we would have typically done to solve this problem is, we would have used an architecture like UNET, which is uh, created specifically to solve image segmentation problems um, and uh, just trained it on a, uh, on a few thousand images for one or two days and obtained the results uh, from, from the model itself. Um, similarly, within TCS, we also have a model called STNet, which we built on top of uh, a very uh, famous image segmentation architecture. This is an enhanced version of it. We could have uh, similarly uh, used this one also, but the problem is, these deep learning the deep learning architectures they use millions of parameters so unit in its vanilla form uses uh, more than 45 million trainable parameters and scnet it has about uh, 30 million optimizable parameters and the problem with these deep learning models with a higher number of parameters is they require a lot of data to get trained so that they can generalize well otherwise they start overfitting and uh, it takes a lot of time to train these models. But on the other hand, the kind of quantum machine learning uh, models, quantum neural networks that we looked into, they had only about 24 to 72 parameters, depending on the kind of ansatz that we had used. Again, we will not get into the technicalities of which kind of ansatz we used and why, uh, what kind of quantum neural networks we used or what kind of encoding. All of those details will be available in the paper that the link for which we'll share towards the end of the talk and interested people could just go through the paper because we don't really have the time to cover all those details here. So in a, in summary, what this does is what quantum machine learning helps us do in this use case over, over deep learning is we can move from millions of parameters to just tens of parameters. And as a result, the models get trained quicker. There is a hit in the performance, but that performance drop is not very high that we cannot really use the model at all. The results that we obtained from the quantum machine learning models, we found were still usable. So the, the next problem that we faced in this case is, we are trying to achieve image segmentation using quantum techniques, but we know that there are no quantum algorithms so far that can help us uh, accomplish this task because we know about Glover's algorithm, we know about Schoen's algorithm, or even the metaheuristic ones like the QE, QAOA, they're not meant for this purpose. 
So the way we handled that situation is we have we broke the problem of image segmentation down into sub problems. So sub problems, as in first we want to classify the image to find out whether the image contains crack or not. When we find that an image does contain cracks, then what we do is we use some quantum techniques to segment the image, to cluster the image. And then we take all of the individual clusters from the image and run a second classification stage, which tells us whether that particular segment is a crack or not. So this is the overall high level pipeline, which we define to solve the problem. And for image classification and segment classification, these are both binary classification tasks. For these, we can use uh, a combination of convolutional neural networks and quantum neural networks. Uh, we can even use quantum convolutional neural networks with classical neural networks. And uh, for classification, we also know that there is uh, a quantum version of SVM, support vector machine, which is available. So any of those methods can be used. But the ones that we have highlighted in green, these are the ones that we specifically used and tried out. And for unsupervised segmentation, that is the middle part of the uh, of this entire pipeline, there here also we can use uh, a couple of algorithms. So we can use edge detection using Hadamard gates. It's called quantum Hadamard edge detection. This, or we can express the image as some kind of a graph and uh, solve a clustering problem on that graph, which there is a very famous paper called quantum graph cuts, which uh, you applies this technique on medical data sets to find out arteries in uh, images. And the one that we used here is a quantum version of the k-means algorithm. And this k-means algorithm, um, th this is a quantum version of it. And, uh, we did not use it as it is, but we used some kind of uh, simplifications to the k-means algorithm because if we were to directly use k-means algorithm, that would have been too complicated because it uses multi-controlled uh, cube, multi-controlled gates, and using so many multi-controlled gates uh, on the present qubits, it's not really very uh, ideal. There, there is a lot of uh, noise or there is a lot of decoherence that would have crept in because they need to be decomposed into two qubit gates. So that was not an ideal scenario. So we used a simplification of this Q-means algorithm also. So we looked at uh, the overall pipeline in the previous slide at a more uh, granular level. If we try to look at uh, what we did uh, is we used a deep learning architecture called VGG16. This architecture was trained on the ImageNet data set. It was a, a pre-trained uh, model. We use kind of transfer learning here to extract features from the images uh, using VGG. So for each image, it returned about 4,096 features to us. And 4,096 features, it's still too high for quantum models to accommodate because we do not have uh, nearly enough qubits for that, uh, for angle encoding. If we use amplitude encoding, that again uses uh, circuits which are going to be very deep. So what we did is to make it uh, more conducive to the uh, NISC era that we are living in, we use principal component analysis to reduce the features from 4096 to the order of 10. So order of 10 as in we use only four or eight features. And we found that using four or eight features for this kind of simple data set and simple task was good enough. And based on those 10 uh, order of 10 features that we got from PCA, we pass them along to the uh, quantum classifier, that is the quantum neural network. And this image classifier, it tells us whether an image contains cracks or not. If we find that the, an image does not contain a crack, then we don't need to proceed with the pipeline anymore. We can safely discard the rest of the pipeline. We can safely discard that image and uh, move on to the next one. But if we do find that the image contains cracks, then we use Q-means algorithm to segment the image. And on each of the segments that we obtained from the image, so to describe what a segment looks like, suppose we have a red apple against a white background. Then if we segment the image, the red apple is going to form one segment, one cluster, and the white background is going to form another cluster. Now we take each of these clusters individually, one at a time, and apply a similar kind of uh, process that we saw previously, sorry, 
So again, we take those clusters one at a time and pass them to VGG16, which is trained on the ImageNet dataset again. Uh, we extract the features from that particular segment, which again gives us about 4,100 features. Again, we use PCA to downgrade those features from 4,100 to about four or eight. And those four or eight features are passed along to a second quantum classifier. Um, and this actually tells us whether that particular segment is a crack or not. And if we find that uh, a particular segment corresponds to a crack, then we mark it as such in the output mask. Um, this is how the overall pipeline uh, is uh, negotiated. And uh, we actually ran this on the devices which are available on AWS. On AWS, through AWS, we get access to uh, Rigetti's processor, which is the Aspen M1, which has about 80 qubits. We also get access to Lucy, which is a processor by Oxford Quantum Circuits. Both of these are superconducting based. And we also have a uh, processor uh, from IonQ, which is based on Iron Caps, um, which, which has 11 qubits. But the advantage here is all of those qubits are all to all connected. It's a fully connected graph. And these are the kind of results that we obtained from uh, each of the models that we had trained. We have compared this again against the classical pipeline. We saw that quantum and classical were kind of performing on par with each other. And we won't try, try to get into the details of the uh, results because we don't, we are overshooting time again. But if someone is interested, they could go through an older version of the paper, which is available on our site at this link. Any questions, please? There was one question in the chat box. If you please raise your hand if you have some questions, just directly ask. Okay, I'll also try to finally open the chat box and see what the question is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for um, this actually, I, I couldn't just find uh, any questions so far, Sam. As far as uh, yeah, my... um, sir, I also can't see any question on yeah. this. So, uh, because you know, it don't you know people will read it in their leisure. I must say, I really enjoyed both the talks, and uh, you know, I mean, I am asking our students to go over it very carefully. You guys are simultaneously doing research and technology and everything together. Very nice. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure, there is sir, one question actually. Uh, what what other problems TCS is working on apart from QML? Of course, we mentioned about uh, op quantum enhanced optimization, quantum simulation. Of course, uh, uh, the, in the quantum chemistry group, we are extensively just doing, and also quantum cryptography. I think we have just kick started because uh, I think uh, just very recently we have recruited uh, two or three PhDs. So uh, quantum cryptography is also just going to be taken up. And um, uh, apart from that, of course, um, the, there are very, when you say QML, there are multiple sort of varieties we are just doing apart from this image uh, uh, related stuff, like imaginary time evolution, basically for again, the optimization kind of problems. And also, uh, I also mentioned about the finance applications, basically using uh, the quantum amplitude estimation. And, I, saw uh, your are, I saw your preprint. So that, and then the, for more the other more details, actually, the, if you can go to our Google Scholar page, or some 14, 15 uh, publications are listed. Each is in a different kind of territory. And uh, recently, we have started also looking into quantum sensing, but not from the, the complete sensing perspective, but uh, a kind of a probe and uh, measurement design and also just studying its properties. So then actually, uh, we are, we are, there are various other things. And also there is one more uh, paper on tensor networks, which would be uploaded very soon into the archive. I think people uh, may be already knowing that's a very good kind of a blend for this classical quantum kind of an hybrid. That means tensor networks actually just uh, deriving their kind of properties or the principles from the quantum mechanics. Of course, the, most of the time they are actually the classical uh, versions of the algorithms or the techniques. But I think we can, there are now also techniques or the methodologies basically to translate them into quantum circuits. So in that way, we can have a kind of a interplay between this tensor network and other, let us say, uh, variational quantum circuits. So there's a beautiful dimensionality reduction, which can be just obtained from tensor networks. And then this one, this our, then we can feed it into variational quantum uh, classifiers. So what I'm trying to say is apart from this um, uh, use cases, sometimes we attack even some of the 
I'm not saying very, very fundamental problems, something very, very research, uh, research oriented. For example, we try to just uh, modify the Grover algorithm to just uh, somehow amenable for Nix era. So we need, need not be always uh, just tied to some kind of applications. In that way, we have a flexibility because both research and innovation uh, work together. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is a good degree of freedom only to just pursue some kind of uh, completely theoretical threads if required. So that's actually just, um, I can just summarize at this moment. Uh, so. Now, you know, you have a, a group in Calcutta also, right? S sir, actually, uh, the, the, now the, because of work from home stuff, people are scattered in, uh, uh, in right, different right. locations, actually. Sayantan is sitting in Calcutta. Today, in fact, uh, if we had planned properly, he would have visited in person, actually. So, okay. even though he works in Bangalore, but presently he's in Calcutta. So, and there is also a question on chemical so, Shantan, why don't you come? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I would like to invite Shantan to come and visit our institute. Definitely, definitely. I'll, uh, anytime we, we can discuss that that's convenient for you, I, I would like, like to visit, sir. So there is also one question on quantum calcula chemical calculations TCS is carrying out. So on, as I mentioned mm -hmm. in the beginning, I think I'm, I don't have sort of much sort of human, uh, except for some superficial th things to just answer this question. But the posters and other uh, sort of uh, published papers, there were some uh, couple of uh, articles also got through in the last QTML. So I will, we will share them basically. If you can write to us, definitely we would be happy to just share the, and sure. also Dr. Shampa Sarkar is leading from uh, TCS on, on, the, on the, I mean, the work related to quantum chemistry. So we will ask just uh, to just forward or otherwise ourselves can just uh, pull out those requisite papers and see them and send it to them, send it to you basically to just see what, what's happening in the quantum chemistry area. So I try to type actually, uh, Sainthan, you can type your email ID. Yes, sir. I will. Uh, sir, I'll provide both. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. See, you know, we have a very strong group in quantum chemistry. Our director, Professor Paul himself, plus other people are there. So some of them are also interested. If Sainthan visits us, we can have a group discussion kind of thing, see what we all are doing, where we can have mutual collaboration. Yes, sir. I think we will put you in touch with uh, Dr. Shampasarkar also, so so that I think uh, that can be strengthened uh, in an appropriate way. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you know extremely good talks, all three of you. Thanks a lot for your encouragement, sir. Let us be in touch and then actually work together. And thanks for your students also. Many of them actually just contribute to us actually. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to present. Okay, sir. so if there are no more questions, yeah, uh, fine. And uh, we will coordinate and your visit Santa here sometime very soon. And uh, so goodbye to all our students. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah.